I told you so I'm a kid in the candy store With the leather on the denim I ain't the cure, I'm the venom If you wanna find me, find the taillight Something's coming in, you're gonna wanna take a red eye It's time to go It's time to go Get ready Welcome, Keely Dunn, FH Umpires, you're the third team. And this is the stream in which we talk about a lot of umpiring things, you know, and I have a plan. That plan sometimes comes off, sometimes, you know, may, maybe not so much, but let's, let's give it a shot. Today, we're going to talk about, hopefully, intentionally raising a raised ball with a hit. Now, to try to create that in one sentence was not the easiest thing I've ever done. So if that doesn't make sense, Let's see if we can actually make sense of it as we discuss it. We're going to talk about clarity on face masks because that was one of the topics of changes in the 2022 rules. And I've seen a lot of questions on the socials and in our Discord about what should be penalized, how should we penalize it, all that kind of stuff. The KNHB has done some crazy things with their guidance. Oh my gosh, what's happening? And lastly, Yurian. We are going to talk about, yes, we are. We are going to get to this, uh, talking about coin tosses and how to deal with captains and how to talk to captains. So I'm looking forward to it. We are definitely going to get there today. I swear. I swear to you. I'm just kidding. I should never promise those things. I am really glad that you're all here and I'm going to say hi to everybody as we go along. But the first things, I just want to get a couple announcements out of the way. This... This thing is happening February 10th, and it's a workshop that I'm offering in the Discord server this time. Mm -hmm. This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Control Elevator, if you want to know about best practices and get some really get involved in some great discussion about how to move up and down the Control Elevator, why you give cards, why you don't give cards, how do you give cards, we're going to demystify the whole package in this workshop. So go have a look, sign up, fhempires.com forward slash control, I believe. And as always, I've got a couple flowers to hand out. Wait, hang on, I've changed this up. Is it gonna work? I don't hear the sound effects. I'm concerned. Where are the sound effects? Fine. CP did it. He only went and did it. Level three indoor MPUA. Congratulations. So, so proud of you. You've been working your butt off and making the other half mad because you're spending so much time with us in the discords. And also four down, which is his unofficial nickname that only he and I understand. Simon only went and passed his uh, level two top panel women's uh, outdoor assessment 
for the MPUA. So congratulations, Simon. So happy for you. You've, you know, I, I just love how you embrace a learner mentality and you are, are, you're doing your thing. It's awesome. And I have some thank yous to give out last week and the week before kind of thing. A couple of rosés came my way. Mm, so nice. Findo. Um, oh, you can't tag anybody in a response any longer? I, why? Oh, I got distracted. Squirrel. Sorry. Stephen Finlater or Finlo of Hook Hockey and the Hi Hockey Ireland uh, media site sent over rosé after the episode last week because Hockey Ireland uh, put out an explanation of the new 2022 rules based on what we had produced in the live stream and also tweeted that out. So thank you very much, Fendo. I really appreciate it. And you're a good friend. Uh, we, we share much tea together, Fendo and I. So good, good person to know. If you don't follow Hook Hockey, uh, please do, because uh, he's a very, very de dedicated hockey journalist. So go have a look there. Um, also bolster, wait, I was going to keep that one up bolster. I think this was Chris Maloney, but I might, I be, might be misremembering. Let's just call them the mysterious bolster. Thank you so much, uh, for your support after last week and none other than Jan Huckendubbler. If you don't know who Jan is, that's okay. Uh, he is, uh, field hockey Canada's and paths ace photographer and a Canadian and massive supporter, not only of our team, not only of hockey in general, but of umpires in particular. He takes some beautiful shots of umpires and it's always a pleasure to be at a tournament with him because I know I'm gonna get good shots of, of whoever's on the field. So Jan, thank you so much for that. He just popped it out of the blue. He's like, hi, I like you, have a rosé. But also he's mad that I'm not drinking French wine because he's, he's French in origin, French. Oh, like a Francais, like a, a real Parisian French Canadian. So don't worry, I do drink lots of red wine as well. I just don't like to talk about all the wine I drink because then you guys are gonna be concerned. So big thank yous, big flowers to everybody, great work. And if you wanna be a part of everything that we're doing, a great place to start is to come into our Discord server. Did you know we have a Discord server? We do. And we're having, uh, this This is where we have conversations, discussions, we offer support and encouragement. You get direct access to me to be able to ask me questions. And we also hold all of the FHU third team umpire or mentoring activities in there. So if you haven't heard about that if you don't know what the fhu 3t is then please pop over to the discord and, and get to know the fam first and then we'll talk about leveling up our relationship because i don't know maybe you're ready for this maybe you're ready for this jelly that would be cool okay time to say hi to everybody and see who's in the chat this will be interesting simon um i'm i'm wondering what's happening with that little thing that you said let's see what's going on rachel Great choice today. I like that you're that you're branching out and and trying something different. This is this is really great. Rose, I'm gonna put this over here. I'm gonna move this here because we don't need to always see it. There we go. And then then it's bigger. Yeah, I like that. I like that look. Niels is here, ace moderator. Good to have you. And Lou, congratulations. I'm glad your tournament was great. And I'm sure that we will hear more about this. You're in the Discord, so come in and tell us about how the whole vibe was and how big the tournament was, because I think people around the world would be really interested to hear what happens at an American tournament of this kind of magnitude. It'd be really cool. Matt Sefton. Mm. I don't know about that term. I'm just going to throw that out there, that I'm just not going to. I'm just going to leave it. But it's good to see you anyway. Very much so. Tea at the ready. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, let's let's see. Must just be you. Oh. Okay. I don't know what happened. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's happy. That's good. Because I did make some changes to the YouTube uh, channel. I went through to all of the third team members that I've seen come into the stream for the last little while, and I made them approved users or 
whatever. So now you have a check mark beside your name, I think. Can somebody verify that's happening? Because I don't even have YouTube open right now to verify I'm even live. I don't even know. Is this thing on? I have no idea. I just cross my fingers sometimes. Just hope it all works out. Shane, today's stream brought to you by Caffeine. I am, or today's comments from you. I applaud your dedication. It was really nice to see you in the workshop the other week and, uh, and getting to know you has been fantastic. So I appreciate that you get up early in the future and come see us. You're a big part of our community. Scott Riley's here, another massive contributor. Good to have you. And yes, strawberry and cucumber sour. Tell me more about this. Maybe not now, but I want to hear more about this because a friend of mine has, uh, Dina Taylor, who runs a great cooking channel. If you're into watching people cooking and you like the whole ASMR of it and you like to feel like you're just kind of sitting at somebody's kitchen counter as they're cooking and just having like a nice homey chat with them, go to Silver Lining Home Place on YouTube. She is doing some really cool stuff in there. And last week she made me, herself, a Pisco Sour. And I love Pisco Sours. I discovered them in uh, the first time I went to Chile. And every time I go, I make sure to have a couple on different occasions after the tournament is over. And it's, yeah. So as you had me at Sour. Cause that, that vibes, <laughs> right? Urian, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna get to it. We absolutely are. Uh, Alan Doe, um, wow. Take it easy, friend. Just, just go slow. Okay. I want you to get carried away. The Pibworth rule is here and the other Luke. 12th doc is here. Uh, it is that time again. Yes. There you go. Hi, Steven. Wait, are you new? <laughs> Please, everybody, give a warm welcome to Steven. And if I'm wrong, whatever, I just rang the DJ air horn for you. Anyway, there you go. Gamer Lucio's here. Thank you so much. I love having, having you pop in. I know you're not a, a massive umpiring person, but the fact you still come is just, it means you're here for the people. So I love that. There you go. Oh, Mr. Operations. I didn't know we had royalty in the house. That's fantastic. You guys are so cute. So formal. Very. I'm glad you're here. Uh, yeah, Ian, um, yes, very sensible move. Now, I think what you need to understand is that regardless of how things are going sort of in your area with uh, Omicron, 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 I don't watch the news. I read it. I, you know, we're, we're in a tough spot here in, in Calgary and Alberta. Things are on the rise. We're expecting a peak in February uh, here. Ontario's in bad shape. I haven't seen what's really happening in British Columbia so far, but basically the major centers in Canada are having, you know, record case numbers, which we know isn't as serious, but still the problem and the risk with traveling abroad is what we saw happen to the Canadian under 21 women's team when they traveled early down to the Junior World Cup just prior to its cancellation. And they ended up getting stuck for almost two weeks and it took some strong maneuvering. Of course, that was the that was when Omicron was first discovered and everybody was misconstruing how it was going on and there were some, you know, I mean, I won't get into the politics of it, but probably some pretty xenophobic reactions from the rest of the world and shutting down South Africa. And so having, having seen what, you know, Taylor and Mel are two dino players who were, uh, who are on that squad and, and, and knowing how difficult it was for them, that, that risk, that magnitude is out there so much more for the men's team because it's repetitive it's so many different places and you never know when suddenly the canadian government will turn around and say if you're re-entering canada from an international location you have to quarantine for 14 days or you can't come right now which is what was happening in the south africa situation so it's 
it's really difficult because it was a great opportunity. And I know the FAH would have been supporting Canada and South Africa in being able to meet the financial obligations of being a pro league team all of a sudden, because it's not like we're walking around flush with cash runs. That, that isn't the case, but, oh, music. but I'm, I, I know that they made this decision thinking about the players and the staff and their obligations to the other, you know, the other teams as well, knowing that that's really important. So really tough, but I think it was the right choice. Sorry, that was on tangent, but important. Still a self Metro. You were there. Uh, so Tall Talk was there when Chris was umpiring in this tournament, knocked it out of the hall, which was illegal because it's indoor and no race balls were allowed. Wait a minute. Ha, how you like that? Yeah, that was that was funny. That was very funny. Stain's here. Hi Mike. Good to have you. Yellow team member. Uh Hey now, let's not tell tales out of school. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Mike's here, good to see you. Come back to the Discord server, I haven't seen you in a, in, a, in, a, in a week. So I feel like I've, you know, I miss you, just saying. You're live-ish. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, I know. It, it, umpiring is awkward by definition, and that's why I love it, because it really just fits with who I am as a person. Super awkward. Ah, another one of our men from the future is here. Good to see you, Andrew. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, I was kind of kidding. You're not new. But are you new to the stream? That's that's what I mean. You're new to our family. This is, this is a big deal. I don't know if you understand just, just what you've signed up for, sir, but... This, this is a big thing. Um, let me know if the music is too loud. I'm feeling like it might be. I'm going to take that down a few notches. It's pretty loud in my own sort of ears. There you go. Okay. There you go. Slightly lower volume. Okay. Um, let me know if that's better as I go along. I'll do it a little lower. <gasps> Peter! Hi. I just wanted to press a button. Okay, let's get into the topics today because uh, there is discussions to be had and things to be done. And, and it's my favorite part of these streams is how much fantastic dialogue we have. So please don't be shy about putting your thoughts, your responses in the comments. Sometimes I'm super in agreement and sometimes I'm not. And that's okay. This is all part of learning and on our first topic, I think you're going to be interested to find out that I am a little bit, well, I'm of two minds and I've been vacillating a lot and I'm going to talk about why. The music's still too loud. Um, let's see. You know what? I'm just going to stop it because I don't want that to be distracting. The overall volume has gone up? That makes no sense. Anyway, there you go. Problem solved. Okay. No music. Right. Oh, I wanted to just touch base on something really quickly. If you haven't seen this article on the FIH website, this, I'm going to pop it into the comments as well for you. So you can go read it yourself, but I thought it was worth touching on just because this is, uh, the director of sport for the FIH, John Wyatt, uh, supplying his comments about the rationale around the rule changes and there's nothing super super earth shattering in any of that but he does mention a few things that i think you might you might be interested in and in here let me make it a lot bigger because i can't read it <laughs> there you go so Speaking about how um, how it was trialed at the uh, Men's Junior World Cup, so the, the regulations were varied, or the briefing at that tournament was varied to include what is now in the rule book and that it was universally adored, which is no surprise because it just takes a lot of pressure off the players. 
It allows them to feel safe. It gives them that discretion. And it means that the umpires don't have to make a lot of big decisions. So that is important. Talking about how the, um, the issue of aerial balls, you know, how the relaxation of the restrictions is, is good. It's good for the game. It's good for the development of the skills and that sort of thing. I thought this was interesting. Though we hope that the simplification, it is a simplification of the removal of the protective penalty corner equipment rule, hoping that it might be adopted immediately in many domestic leagues, even if they're currently halfway through, as it makes this game safer, easier to understand, and easier to officiate for umpires. I'm kind of shocked that John Wyde and I are completely seeing eye to eye on anything, but he's absolutely got this right here. And I... England hockey, come on. Like, they're just, there's just no reason for this not to be employed. Okay, so um, in the Discord server, Mr. Milford uh, referred to a release that came out from England hockey about how this is not going to be employed until September. Unfortunately, because it's in a protective space, he can't. He couldn't just post the link to it. It's, it's in the private England Hockey Hub, or whatever the case might be. And so you you can't see it yet, but it will get out there. But it just has to. Anyway, the future rule changes I thought was interesting as well. Just talking about, um, as always, particular interest in penalty corners and how. How can we maintain it, uh, maintain the safety and keep it being exciting and that sort of thing. And this, uh, was it, I don't think it was Yuri and I think Alex and I were talking in the discord server about the new equipment that is sort of coming out, including thigh and foot guards. Okay. I haven't seen foot guards, but I sure have seen thigh guards. And how they're they're going to keep looking into this and figure it out. So be on the lookout. And th this is what's interesting about watching Pro League matches is this is where the teams who are at the cutting edge do try out the latest and greatest. And who knows, maybe you'll start seeing some cool looking foot guards. And you'll see more of those thigh guards that we saw the American women wearing. Uh, when they play GB several months ago. So there you go. So have a read of that article. It's it's good to kind of get the, the tenor of what's happening from the inside. So there you go. It is really good. Um, they didn't just custom paste. They decided to reword things. Yeah, not surprised whatsoever. Hi, Tim. It's, it just, as I've said before, it smacks of petulance and just, just not, not wanting to do what you're told. Stop it. Okay. Um, if it's medically required, yes. Um, if it's not, should it be allowed on the pitch? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, right? They, they need to be collecting more data on what kind of injuries are being suffered by defenders who are defending penalty corners. Um, like I kind of alluded to last week, yeah, it, it, it hurts when you take a ball in the thigh, absolutely, but it's not the same risk of injury generally as when you take a ball to the knee or to the hand. Or even to the foot. So I'll be interested to see what this whole foot thing happens. But there you go. Yes, it's always good to see you guys. And Chris Pelmore is here. Yeah, and that is the downside. Right? So let's keep talking about it and keep figuring it out. And bright ideas are always welcome. Okay, let's get on to the raised hit. Because this came up. In the Discord server, I think it was Nick Crick who is part of a WhatsApp group that started talking about a play that occurred back in, I think it was, I think it was posted in 2018, but we're going to see, we're, I'm going to play it right now. 
I have talked about this issue before. Talking Tokyo, day 13, I analyzed this play. I analyzed the next two clips, or the, yeah, the next two clips that I'm going to show you. Had a big discussion about it, and you know what? I can't find the recording. I don't remember even in the slightest what I said at that point. So if any of you were part of the Talking Tokyo <laughs> presentations in the Discord server, I'm interested to, to hear how much I'm changing my mind on this because I, I am struggling with the entire concept. You'll see why in a moment. This is the play. Played on his left hand side. Clever little ball down the touchline. Played by James Sutcliffe. Going to hold it off. Oh, well, that's a. <laughs> Didn't belong in this sport. <laughs> no, that's a beautiful shot. <laughs> We're hitting it out of the park. Yeah, well, obviously, happy it was controlled and clearly it was high enough not to be dangerous. <laughs> okay, so big thanks to Galvanized for getting that together. And we're gonna look at the replay a few times because there's a few issues I just wanna I just wanna push out of the way so that we don't get bogged down with that. But you can see these are screenshots from the Facebook discussion. It says three years, so I'm pretty sure this was all around 2018 that this post went up. And, you know, a couple of very familiar names, uh, Baz, who's been on the show, Crispy, who's uh, in the yellow group and on the Discord server. Here's a familiar name who proclaimed nice and simply, no danger play on, and then kind of went on a little bit of a tear here, here when somebody insisted it should be called. So now we're going to apply a rule meant to prevent players from chipping the ball up the field from the ground to a player taking the ball out of midair. Let's not look for the finest hairs to split. And yeah, wait. And then this was the last one. Tim Bond, who's a, an FIH umpire from Australia, who's umpired at such tournaments as the Commonwealth Games, um, makes a really good point here. And it's a point that we've been discussing in our recent huddle here that really it comes down to it being very similar as the forehand edge hit that it will be extremely dangerous if it goes wrong and it has a fairly high likelihood of going wrong it just happens to work out in some situations so the intention of that kind of rule then is to not allow the potential for the danger to manifest so let's have a quick look at the rule right here. This is 9-9. Players must not intentionally raise the ball from a hit except for a shot at goal. The raised hit must be judged explicitly on whether it is intentional. It's not an offense to raise the ball unintentionally from a hit, including a free hit, anywhere in the field unless it's dangerous. That's the key part of 9-9 that we're talking about. So... I think in this situation, we can all feel pretty confident that the intentional element of that aspect of the rule has been met in this kind of scenario and in the scenarios I'm going to show you as well. Okay. And what I find interesting about the entire discussion is just how appealing both arguments are. First off, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about whether danger does exist or not. And there were a few commenters in the original post who said, that's dangerous. And the actual execution of that skill is not. As the ball is coming into that receiving area, there is an attacker who is behind the defender who takes the cricket shot who is far enough away that as the ball is coming down, it's not dangerous there. He starts to approach. Okay. It's hard to tell whether this is a deflection or this is an aerial. Okay. But either way, white player 
has the ball. And either there's a five meter infringement from the player behind if you thought that there was some form of disadvantage or the attacker from behind is creating the danger. Okay, because the white player has it and has the space. So either way you slice it, it's irrelevant, it's white, ready to go with the ball. Okay, so we have, we have all that clear. We talked yesterday in the huddle, and I'm, for those of you who are, who are in that chat, and if I start misstating things, please do chime in and, and correct me and make sure that I don't go too off base. But one of the issues that we have here is that as the, the ball was falling and then gets raised further. So one of the arguments that we batted about was, okay, if the ball is hit out of midair but stays at the same height or goes lower... Does that then mean that this doesn't trigger Rule 99? Because the ball isn't being raised. It's being lowered, in fact. I mean, let's face it, friends. The whole problem with this is that this rule was written at a time where nobody was doing this kind of stuff. Just like with the aerial rule in, in general that rule doesn't work with the way that the game is being played now. The way that it's phrased, all that kind of stuff, I've, I've said it over and over again, it doesn't suit now how aerials are able to go straight off the free hit, that players have developed the skill to be able to aerial off the run, that players are aerialing not just sort of straight ahead in a vertical line, but have developed the ability to go and the, and the strategy, the tactics to go off on diagonal lines down the pitch and or go straight across in order to basically to, to uh, switch the field. So what the rule describes is a limitation on a very discrete situation that doesn't represent how aerial is being thrown. This, to me, smacks of the same problem. It doesn't contemplate that players could be hitting the ball out of midair and could be doing so safely. The other thing that I, I find is really interesting for me is that three years ago, almost four years ago, when this discussion first happened, I was a lot closer to being on the pitch at a high level on a regular basis. I've now been retired for several years, few years, and I'm doing this armchair development coaching discussion stuff on a regular basis. And my inclination was to look at the wording of the rules and to look at restrictions and think, yeah, that's the legit way to go. That is a gamekeeper or a gatekeeper mentality that is so easy for us, especially senior people in the game to fall into, where we look for reasons to say no. Three and a half, almost four years ago, I was in a player mentality, a performance mentality, where it was much more front in my mind that we want to stay out of the player's way. So my inclination when I looked at this kind of play was to say, yeah, play on, whatever, just go for it. So... I find that interesting and I wanted you guys to hear that and I wanted you to maybe take a second to evaluate whether that might be part of your, your process here, that you're, you're battling the same sort of mm, inclinations. I don't want to use the word bias because I hate that word, but that might be a part of it for you. Okay. Before I move on to the next example, I'm going to look at the discussions and see what's happening here. Um, and let's see what, what kind of thoughts you have. Okay, Luke is talking about some knee and, and that sort of thing. Could have become, it could have been dangerous because the player wasn't expecting and could have been hit by the backswing. Um, I don't know. That's probably... Not part of the 99 problems I see in this scenario. 
the, the player was trying to put pressure on the receiver and running up behind anybody in this game, that's your fault. <laughs> okay. We know that culturally, if you play, you don't run up behind anybody because what if, what if he pulls backwards a little bit into you? It's, there's no obligation on that white defender's part to know where the attacker is behind him and make sure to, to stay out of his way. No, it's the attacker's job. So let's not get that twisted. Uh, well, yes, but I have more, Ian. I have more because this isn't the first time we've seen it. So that's the argument, Shane. But when you look at the wording of 9-9... This is an intentionally raised ball on a hit. It fits the wording. It fits the wording. And so we have to wrestle with whether the principle that Tim Bond talked about, and many others have talked about, and I talked about yesterday as we were batting this about in the huddle, should we be deterring the attempt of this skill because of the high likelihood of failure and therefore danger? Because that's what the forehand edge hit was. It was a very strict, no, you just don't do it. Once it got outlawed, it didn't matter if it caused danger. It didn't matter if it was advantageous. It was just, no, you cannot use that edge of the stick. The reason being, it was often misplayed. And because the edge of the stick imparts so much more energy, blah, 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 physics, I don't know, we didn't want it to happen. So that's where you go, Nick Watt. Hello, sir. You've seen this happen a couple times. Could be described as an intentionally raised hit, but usually catches on parts by surprise. Right. So that's a really good point, Nick. And, and surprise is part of it, but also our instincts as umpires, as people who are in the middle of this game... We trust our guts to tell us, do we need to protect players from this? We're not thinking of the long-term consequences for the game. What we're thinking about is right now, what do I have to do to make sure that this game here is fair and safe? And in that moment, I'm not sure who the controlling umpire was. We all know David Monger was here on the close side. I don't know what was going through that person's head, but... I feel like if I were in that situation and wearing the orange shirt, that's exactly what I'd be doing is saying, do I need to step in here? No, I don't. I want to stay out of the player's way. Also dope skill. <laughs> you want to see that happen as an umpire. You want to promote that because that's why you're there is to, in my view, help players play their best game on that day. So that's a really good point, Nick. Thank you for throwing that in. Yeah, the commentators were talking about cricket, baseball. Oh, yeah, sport ball. Sport ball. <laughs> yes. Um, it's very rare that any raised ball is blown unless it causes, le causes legitimate evasive action. Yeah, and because that's kind of the spirit through which we go through. Yeah, it may come down to expectations on the pitch because it leads to what players can reasonably prepare for. So what we have then, Scott, if we look at, okay, at this level, these players, you know, are much more likely to have the ability to execute this safely. But what about at county level four something? What about under 14 kids? Do we need to be not letting those players attempt this skill? What about over 50 masters? You know, does this mean that a strict wording of the rule applies in some situations, but we don't apply the strict wording of the rule because it's not just saying that danger is different at different levels. This is saying, yeah, we're not even going to really apply this because we'd rather apply the danger principle. So that gets into a really dicey territory in a lot of ways. Could be a deflection. Okay. Okay. There you go. Not important. Yes, the umpire was definitely looking at whether he needed to do something and then was like, eh, okay. Yep. Very true, Ian. 
the point of reception becomes the new point of transmission. Danger governs, but there's no danger. But if the point of reception is, is a new point where this is considered a separate hit, that is a raise of a ball. Hi. <laughs> Just stop talking sport ball at me. I, you know I don't know what this is. No, Scott, <laughs> that we do not apply aerial rules to unintentionally deflected balls. End of story. I have been very, very firm on this because that is a misinterpretation of the spirit of what the aerial ball is. It's only intentionally raised passes, which we would require players to understand that they have to allow receptions to happen. Okay. The good news is in five years or 10 years, this whole aerial ball rule thing is going to go away and everything's just going to be on danger. Thank goodness. But we're going slowly. It's baby steps. Good thing. But please, no, do not start imparting five meter rules. It's only safety. Bang. Bang. Okay. <laughs> What's one for, eh, Mike? <laughs> Wait, can I get to it really quickly? One, four, A. Meanwhile, let me get back to my scenes. This is dangerous. Like you're probably totally kidding because you just made up a rule. Yeah, exactly. That's the center line. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just got trolled. I'm just kidding. That was very good. You'd probably go back to the unintentionally raised deflection, Chris. On what grounds? On what grounds? Because it created danger? Here's a situation steps around. It goes to Jack. that happened at the Asian that's Champions Trophy. Running. And that's some clearance. Good running by the captain, number 11. Back upstairs. Rules yeah, cool. that you cannot yes, not deliberately yes, lift the ball Street. other than Rolling the shot up. at goal, the letter and of the law. I will check the whole situation. Yeah, you check the thanks. So it comes out to top and stops. The shot is got away cleanly. Charged down by a runner. There's a touch that lifts it, so that's that's a knee pad that's caused the lift. And then the clearance here. So the letter of the law is you can't deliberately lift the ball other than a shot at goal. And I only know that because there was a social media conversation about it in the last two days from the English Domestic League. Not I don't know if you can hear the commentary. Opinion. Simon is, oh, is that too high? explaining that's really, that's really the, the Beeston incident that we just saw happened like knee. days that's prior to high. this happening jumped. at the Champions Trophy. Fair point. So what you have is a drag flick. It gets, it hits a player. And the ball is fluffing up. And then there is what can be argued. We're just going to have to assume it's safe because that's how Nazmi called it in the initial case. Okay. So that's not, that's hit his knee before his foot's come off the floor. So this is a very similar. Then comes down. You know, well, sort of, sort of cricket shot. Nazmi, uh, the first shot on the goal was dangerous. It went to the knee of the defender, so therefore, it's gonna be free hit out. All right. So what ends up happening is because the initial drag flick was too high and hit the player on the knee, and it hit the knee so definitively that the knee guard goes flying off, and not the shin. He didn't have to make a decision about the grounds of appeal. Okay. And this, and this is, again, we've talked about video referral rules and how the decision does not have to be based on just that incident. But as Jakub said on the, on the announcement on the radios, he said, I will look at the whole situation. I think because Jakub saw this and, and knew he was going to be going back to evaluate whether the flick was dangerous or not in the first case. So we didn't find out what these guys thought of it. And I can't remember. I th Hypothetically speaking, 
imagine having a conversation with somebody a couple years later and saying, what would you have done? And they say, I'm really glad I didn't have to make that decision. This is very difficult, very difficult. Okay. Steven, what if white miss hit that shot? Absolutely. What if a drag flick goes into somebody's face? What if somebody hits a ball from the ground and miss hits it and it goes, what if somebody hits a reverse tomahawk and clocks somebody in the head? All those things happen. And yet none of those are banned outright. None of those attempts are banned. So are we saying that the safe attempt at a restricted stroke should be upheld, even though it all works. So what we're calling is a technicality and not the result. That's very true. Oh, you, Mike, you're talking about the back end of the rules, aren't you? The back end of the rules aren't rules. They're informative and not particularly informative. Objectives. One, four. Yes. Yes. That's just, that's just guidance. That ain't, that ain't a rule. Just so you know. It was your opinion, but not how you umpire. Um, uh, personally, you think rule 910 should apply to anyone receiving a ball from above their shoulders, no matter how it got there, as long as going up in the flight is safe. Receiving a ball from above their shoulders. Well, I mean, potentially, do we apply that to shots at goal as well? Because then that clears out a lot of shots at goal. That could get really dicey for goalkeepers because they are using their stick to hit the ball out of the air. If there's any swinging motion at all, that's going to be a hit. So now we're talking about how goalkeepers who might be trying to keep the ball away from the players because they can't, they can't hit it off their back line. They can deflect it, but they can't hit it intentionally off their back line. So now how do they, how do they clear it away from danger? They don't want to put it back in the bodies of the players, especially not their own teammates. Dutchie, you're talking about indoor rules. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna shut that down. Okay. Where are we at? Where are we at? I said, yeah, exactly. Right. He did that. Would they have kept the referral? Yes. Uh, so regardless, they got the outcome they wanted. Um, wait. How does this work? Let's not get sidetracked on that right now because this is hard enough. Let's, let's, Scott, let's go into the Discord and, and flush that out if you really want to, but that's kind of hard. Oh, Mr. Beg. I don't know if I forgive you, but I'll think about it. You'd give the free hit also, but I'd like to know what the players thought about. Um, you, you might be talking about this one here. The intentional hit rule doesn't mention danger. Are we supposed to ignore the rule because it's a bit out of date. Now, what, um, what Scott brought up interestingly triggered in my mind, the whole notion of the ball being above the shoulders. And now that players can play the ball above their shoulders. So this rule has not changed since the whole notion of how players can play the ball above their shoulders and use their stick above their shoulders. That's changed now. Players can do that, but this rule has stayed the same. So there's another aspect that hasn't gone in lockstep under the rules where you can anticipate that players are going to be reaching up and they're going to be doing these things that they have to do safely, but they are now allowed to do 
And that opens up the possibility for this to occur much more. Um, let's see. Whatever the brilliant answer was, I hope it was me and I, and I accept. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the flat clearance, a flat clearance in clip two probably would have been dangerous head height for red. Yeah. Right. So the irony is, is that we're saying like, we're outlawing something because it's, it's likely going to go wrong, but actually playing it in a way that would satisfy the technical reading of the rule would very much like make it more dangerous, more likely to be dangerous. That's another aspect, right? Really well pointed out, Ian. You had a similar situation, the PC deflection off the goal, goalkeeper defender clearing hit on goal line straight into you. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't get to call things as dangerous to you. Unfortunately, we, we don't get to do that. We can be mad if players do it intentionally and that's a whole different kettle of fish, but we're part of the pitch. So. Um, no, that's not how it works, Luke. So we'll, we'll go into it later. Okay, everybody. This is the portion of the show where things may go dark because I'm going to put up a clip from the Olympics because it's not just these two incidences that have occurred. This happened at the Olympics. I talked about it on day 13, talking Tokyo and don't know what I said other than we talked about those other two clips as well. Okay. You ready? You ready? I may have to trim this out. <laughs> and scene. This is the gold medal game, friends. Little save off the goalkeeper comes up. Belgian defender hits it from a relatively low position and raises the ball. It takes a couple seconds, but Marcin, who is down in that end, does yell play on. Great pass to a Belgian player, and off they go to the races. Okay. I'm going to go back to this scene because I want to limit the amount of time that um, the OBS gets on my case. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, that could be old stuff as well. But I think I, I, I know that 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 frame of, of, of that is all about indoor anyway. So, so here we are in a situation where in a gold medal game, in a vital situation, there is no way, no way on the planet that Marson's going to call a penalty corner for that. No way. It was done safely, despite the fact the Australian attacker tried to like, after the fact, go, ah, I'm, I'm doing legitimate evasive action. Ah, look at me. Marson's like, nah. It felt right. And yet, arguably, it doesn't fit the rule. But every time we see it where it isn't dangerous, we're okay with it in our hockey gut. And if it goes wrong, as Stephen rightly pointed out, it can go wrong. Well, we trust players all the time not to do stupid things that they don't have the skill to do. The mentality that we have to, we have to not let players try to do skills by outlawing it in the rule book. They're not allowed to aerial. They're not allowed to reverse tomahawk. They're not allowed to drag flick. They're not allowed to do these things. They're not allowed to try them because they might get it wrong. 
and the consequences might be severe. Well, is that the right approach? Is that a valid approach? And I struggle with that a lot because skills will not develop if we are gatekeepers from a big perspective of the rules committee of regulations of as umpires on the pitch, the game will not evolve. The risks are high. The risks are high every time when we go out there, when a perfectly safe, safely hit ball gets accidentally deflected because somebody tries to reach out and intercept it, and then it hits a player on the back of the head, and she is gone from us before she even hits the turf. That happened in Australia. The biggest consequences that I've heard about in our game come from completely inadvertent, innocent, not even uh, not even outlandishly attempted skills in a context of our game. So I, I really struggle with this. I can tell you the only thing I know for sure that if I were on that pitch in the Beeston game, the Beeston, I think it was Exeter, University of Exeter, if I was on that pitch, if I happened to be on the pitch for a men's gold medal final, if I were in that Japan, uh, th that Japan Korea game, I would have called play on too. In the moment, I would have called play on. And after the fact, I would have said, I didn't feel it was dangerous. I don't want to penalize a team for something that isn't dangerous. So I don't have a final answer. Hi, Tom. Yeah, it does make you feel uneasy. And I, ha I was part of a discussion in a FIH Academy course that I was on with Darren Cheeseman. And, and Darren talked about his experiences of innovating skills in England, doing, hitting the ball in, in really wild ways, like from the, the weak side of his body and training himself to be able to hit the ball from over there effectively, accurately with some pace and coaches saying, no, don't ever do that in a game. Never stop doing that because it looked wrong because it's not something we see. How did we react the first times we saw aerial passes going up? We were terrified. We were like, oh my God, dogs and cats are living together. This is chaos. It, it takes experimentation and it takes that breakthrough of those initial periods of holy crap, what is that before we know that something works and can work, but also can go wrong. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting all these things together in sort of a very big picture thing. At your level, you'd be blowing danger at those levels play on. And that's, we, we just get back to that every time, even though the wording of the rule doesn't really support us doing that, does it? Because it doesn't say that we get to evaluate it based on danger. We're ba it says solely on the intention. Rule 9-2. 9-9. Nine -nine. It's the 9-9. Nine -nine. Sorry, Brooklyn 9-9. Nine -nine. It says... A raised hit must be judged explicitly on whether or not it is raised intentionally. Unintentionally, we only judge danger, but we have to explicitly judge it on intention. So I don't know. I really don't know. I think the fact that so many of us are looking at this and trying to look at it in that way that I would call it based on what the actual danger was in the situation and that we trust players to just to act responsibly at all times. Rule nine, before we get into rule nine, one players must ask, act responsibly at all times. That's what we are looking for. 
It is a really rare play. Um, I'm not sure what was that. Yes. Lower levels weren't stopped from using other skills such as reverse tomahawks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we still, we still see this. We, we see this happening. We see the kids who love the reverse tomahawks and they come out in a game and they chop it and we're like, oh my God, stop doing that. We want to, we want to prevent danger as, as coaches, as parents, as fellow players, as umpires, as fans, we, we want to, we want to keep people safe, but we also have to understand that mistakes are part of the game. Mistakes are part of growth. Mistakes are part of evolution and development. So if we don't allow mistakes to occur, it'll never, it'll never get better. <laughs> Wait, which, which, which one do I, do I say? I'm like, ah. Yes, unique and strangely brilliant is a great way to describe him. And when he talks about how our perception of what fits within the norms of the game really affect the development of skill and, and the whys and the hows, challenging our thinking that way, I think is, is very important to do. And I want to make sure that as umpires, we don't default to being gatekeepers. We don't default to the saying, no, because I said so. Because that's what olds like me trend to. That's what we want to do. In order to push ourselves and grow, we have to allow for things to change and be different and to make us uncomfortable. Growth is in the uncomfortable spaces. We, If you go on Instagram and you see these slogans, there's got to be something to it. And there is. So when you see something that makes you feel uncomfortable, question yourself, why? Why do I feel uncomfortable about this? Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, and, and that's a problem too, Dutchie, is, is I'm saying that, that the rule wasn't written thinking that the ball would already be off the ground and somebody would be half following it. And it's impossible to push a ball from midair. You can't. You could try to catch it and, and hold it on your stick and then flick it. I haven't seen, I have not seen that skill yet performed at, legally, <laughs> at any level of play yet. Not yet. Am I going to see somebody do it? I bet tomorrow I'm going to turn on a pro league game and go, oh, there it is. There's Felix Denayer just bloop, whoop. <laughs> Wait, I think I did. I did. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to have to go find it. We were having a watch party. Does anybody remember from yellow? Oh, I'm going to have to ask in the discord. It did happen where somebody held it on a stick and then he flicked it out of midair. He aerialed out of midair. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. See, the game is evolving. It's happening, but for now, <laughs> it's going to be very common that it has to be hit. Yep. And what happens, Ian, is that the game pushes it along. So umpires keep pace with the game in front of them. Our interpretations are shaped by our experience being a part of these matches. We are part of the art of the game and we are part of the leadership of the game. And the FIH doesn't just sit there and watch us be gatekeepers and then say, okay, now you're going to change it up. Actually, they watch us push the interpretations further and further and further and then go, okay, now we're going to change the rules to catch up. Case in point, 919 or whatever, the aerial rule. That came about because at the 2018 World Cup semifinal, Dan Barstow and whoever his colleague was at the time waved that Auckland interception on because they knew, they knew in their hockey gut that it was the right play. 
And it was the right call for the game. Even though the the wording of the rule was technically that as soon as the ball's in the air, suddenly nobody can try to receive it except the initial receiver. Like, it's just, like, no, that's ridiculous. When you look at that situation, of course somebody should be able to come in and intercept it. We are part of that vanguard. And to pretend otherwise is to ignore our responsibility to apply critical thought to these situations, to have these discussions, to see what the players are doing, to find out what they want, to find out how it affects the game. It's our job. It just is. Um, I think we're comfortable because we're saying we can pick and choose. Um, yeah, but... W- <laughs> There's a lot of that gray area in the rule book because of advantage and because of danger. Those two principles are baked into our rules. And so we have a lot of experience deciding when we're going to apply rules and when we're not going to. And some people in the game, it drives them crazy because they want absolute certainty. They want the whistle to go every time the ball hits the foot, no matter why or where it happens on the pitch and who's around and who gains benefit and who doesn't and blah, blah, blah. Even if it's just slight graze and it doesn't even change direction, but there was contact. Yep. We want every one of those blown and those people are idiots because that creates an absolute game, right? Um, send me that link. So this is something that we talked about yesterday, Scott, if the players play the ball downwards, but you can see in many of those situations that the attempt to play it downward would actually lead to more danger, potentially. I'd say, wait, you're, you're half volleying a ball out of midair into a crowd instead of trying to get it away from the crowd. Look at it from that perspective. Whoa, <laughs> now we don't like that. And even though it technically complies with the rule, does that rule actually enforce safety? There you go. <laughs> do what other people do and get me in trouble. Say, Keely told me to. Or Keely told me not to. I love hearing back on that because, first of all, they always have misinterpreted what I've said. And then second of all, oh, great. I'm in trouble. There's a difference between intentionally hitting a raised ball and intentionally raising a ball from a hit. Mm -hmm. There is a difference, but I think the way we've implied it is that it is an intentionally raised. The intent is the raise, not the intent is to hit. So, oh my God, is it? I can, I can skip face masks. I can. We can do that later. Oh, my God. Uh, yes, the definition of push. Dutchie McDutch, uh, you can't push a ball if it's not on the ground. Pushing is moving on the ground. Yeah, right? The, the rules just don't even contemplate these skills being executed because, again... The rules committee is full of senior people from the game who start getting a little more rigid. And I, I put myself in this category of people who are getting more rigid in their thinking and I'm challenging myself. I'm trying to stop myself from being that person. What helps you is the rules state what all the offenses are, but there's also a rule that explicitly states that not all offenses need to be blown. Yeah, let's go. Yep. So, I am, I am questioning what's happening there, Ian. That is interesting. Okay. I am going to, do I need to do face masks? I'm going to look at my scene. Nope. We're going to save face masks for next week. Coin toss. <laughs> it's only fair because I know Daniel is actually here. So he's here. Let's do this. Finally, 
pre-match chats with captains. What should you discuss with the captains, general practices, what would benefit as a starting point, all that kind of stuff. Now, first off, okay, thank you. I don't care then. Um, sorry, but uncapped games are really, really annoying. So there are two What Up Wednesdays previously that I'm putting in the comments and they will be in the description as well, where don't click over to them yet because you're here. And if you click on those, then you're going to, okay, like option click. Do you know how to do that? Like, or right click and then open it in a new window or a new tab and then save it. And then you can like bookmark it and go watch it again later. I talked about working with the captains and talked about the coin toss in general. So those might be worthy resources to go back to later. And generally what I think is interesting about this, this, the way this question is constructed is that it implies that this coin toss is a time for a discussion and time for information to be conferred and, and all that kind of stuff. And, in reply to that, I'll say, no, <laughs> it's not because there is very little you're going to be able to tell players at the beginning of a game before they step on the field that is even going to penetrate their heads. If they actually listen to you, the chances of them understanding what you're saying are very, very slim. And this isn't a knock against players. I'm not saying that players are dumb. I'm saying that, that captains have a lot going on in their heads before they're stepping onto the pitch. Adrenaline, adrenaline levels are very high. They're nervous. They've had all these instructions coming from their coaches. They've got all these other players that they're going to be worrying about. They've got their own performances to worry about. The last thing on their minds, 99 problems, and what the umpire tells them of the coin toss ain't one. My advice on the coin toss is to keep it very, very simple. This is a point of time at which you are building a rapport with the captains, not telling them what you expect, what to do, what rules you're going to enforce, that you want a big five, that you want any of those things. This is a time that you get to tell them your name, find out their names, figure out where, where they're going to be playing on the pitch a little bit. And if you're going to talk about anything, it's about the how you expect them to communicate with you, i.e., e.g. If you have a major question on a big play, I'd like you to come to me, only you. All the rest of your teammates, you need to keep them away. You and I are going to have a discussion about it. And then I may confer with my colleague, et cetera, et cetera. When I need things to change on the pitch, I in turn will come to you and I will ask you to communicate to your team. That's it. That's all you should be talking about. The dangers of going into a pre-match chat or a coin toss conversation with captains and saying, I want the fives to be big today. First of all, there's no such thing as a big five. There's five meters. It's science, friends. It's science. It's either five meters or it's four and a half or it's seven or it's something else. There's no such thing as a big five. So please don't ever say that nonsense coming out of your mouth because it destroys your credibility as an umpire. Say, that's not five. One more step. If you need to show players what five meters is, measure it out for them. But big five, absolute, absolute nonsense. Don't. If you say, we're going to be really strict on tackles today. Why? You enforce the rules differently depending on how you feel that day or differently depending on the, the teams that are on the pitch or differently because you didn't get your morning coffee, you enforce the rules of play fairly and consistently every day to the best of your ability. 
End of story. To say otherwise makes you look like you are going to deliberately change the way you call a game. No. Don't do it. It's scary. Uh, let's see. I'll look for your comments to help fuel the, the rest of my conversation. Most of the captains don't pass on the messages to their teams anyway. No, they don't. As a captain, I know I don't. <laughs> Any of the years that I was a captain, I, I didn't bother. I know what I need to do to control my team. Okay, so I have, I have my own methodology, but, and the messages that I tell the team are, I'll be telling them to do different things, depending on what the umpires are going to be providing to us. They're only interested in the question they ask you if they ask you something. Yeah, they might have a question for you. And if they're going to ask you a question based on the rules, it's your job to try to do your best to give them a very quick explanation. But it's also an opportunity to say, that's all I can tell you right now. How about we talk about this more after the game as well? If you see it happen in the game, let, let's make sure we talk about that, that thing later, okay? Because that's an opportunity to keep developing that relationship. We'll play as much advantage as possible, unlike any other day. Exactly, Mike. Like that would, that would drive me insane. That would drive me insane. You play as much advantage as, as possible all the time to the best of your ability because advantage is 12.1, a good thing. <laughs> what is possible to play in terms of advantage changes over the course of a game, depending on the skill levels of the players, the pace at which the game is being played, the temperaments, all kinds of things. So what is possible changes. That makes sense. <laughs> but it's like saying, you're going to play with a stick and a ball today. No shit, Sherlock. Yes, you are. <laughs> so there you go. So I think reframing that moment of the coin toss away from this is an instructional disciplinary opportunity where I get to tell you what to do into this is a chance at building a, a relationship here that will give you a massive tool going into the game. You've humanized yourself. You've set out expectations. You've almost dare I say, got the captain on your side by saying, look, the, the, he, here's, here's what you can do for me. This is what I'm going to do for you. If I'm concerned about the level of dissent that's coming from the team, I'm going to ask you to deal with it first rather than just start carting people off the pitch. You know, do you appreciate that as a captain? Hell yeah, you do. You want that opportunity to do the right thing and to keep your players on the pitch. But you, as the captain, are keeping the players on the pitch. It's not the umpire's job to keep the players on the pitch. Hijack. So, Daniel, the reasons for bringing the query up, one in the match before we had a captain say, no other messages, uh, as we did the coin toss. Yeah, because they're used to umpires who say wrong things. Two, making sure I can pass on correct advice to umpires you coach. You've got the correct advice now, Daniel. Okay. I, and I, I truly believe this, uh, this is, it, it's so much more important for umpires to work with captains rather than instruct them. And I think Hamish isn't here, but he, he did have that comment. Um, he, he asked, well, I, I like being told, you know, this, that, and the other at a junior level, because it helps me learn the rules. And I say, well, that that makes sense but did it really actually help you learn the rules or was it the fact that you it, it gave you the opportunity to think about this umpire as being somebody that you will ask questions of at a good time after the game well before the game to get clarity and to build that relationship that's the key there you go would you try and show empathy by asking them about the match ball color or only mention if one of them asked for something other than white? 
Um, I, yeah, I mean, I've, if somebody's supplying a ball, I might look at this and go, oh my God, you don't have anything better than this? <laughs> this is terrible quality or whatever the case. I guess part of that, Scott, that's very local region dependent. If there's requirements for the quality or the color of the ball that you provide, you know, I don't know, but I know that if I'm charged with the safety of the players on the pitch, then my concern is, is the color of the ball the the right color so that I can see what's happening and keep the players safe? That's my concern. So as long as it complies with that, it's not my business. But if players start, you know, asking about it, that's that's up to local regulations. I can't really give you much more than that on that. Yep. Have fun. Check the name. I I write the captain's number on my um, on my hand with all my other information and I put a little little dot beside whoever has the first coin toss or first coin toss the first center pass and I don't have to change that because I know in the second half I flip it so the the the, the little ball indicator goes with the captain who whose team has that first center pass keeps the the information there and it just helps me I'm like oh yeah number four number four ah there she's hey number four can we have a little chit chat about how I've had to push your players back to five meters twice now I don't want that anymore okay this is dumb get them back or else end of story okay the only other thing um Ian would be on day one of the new rules oh boy <laughs> But yeah, I would be spending time before the match starts going to the coaches before the coin toss and saying, Hey, are you, did you see the new rules? <laughs> Do you know about them? Do you have any questions about them? And of course, you're not going to go to them when they're in the middle of talking to their team. But if you're not arriving at a game or if you don't have the opportunity before a game that has coaches in well enough time to be able to go to them and say, let's, you know, let's, let's have a talk about something. Then you need to get there earlier, <laughs> get there earlier, do your work because that five minutes of which you spend two minutes talking to the coach and confirming that they don't know about the 2022 rules with the face masks, which is probably the thing you're going to see more of than the aerials, then you know, you have an opportunity to be that person helping shape a good game because you're educating everybody involved. And when you don't make the call the first time on the pitch and the coach yells, you say, remember that rem uh, uh, we, we, and then they go, Oh yeah. Okay. Right. This is good time. A good time to do it. You're so pleased with this advice. Good. Can you let all umpire note coaches know the same thing? They always expect a whole chat at the players. I can't, oh boy, <laughs> other umpire coaches. I can't control, um, I can't make a, other umpire coaches better other than the ones who are here. So the Simon Milfords and, and you know, Daniel Marsh is getting into it and, and everybody else here who works with umpire coach, who works with umpires in a coaching capacity, you're welcome. This is important, okay? And as umpires, I hope all of you move into some form of a coaching role in some respect because you need to exponentially multiply your influence. You need to pass on what you've learned and help leave the game in a better state. This isn't a one-for-one -one exchange. You've got to create five little umpires that come after you who you've been able to help along the the game needs you we need you that th th there just isn't any compromise on that so you can do that part i'll keep working on the umpire coaches i have contact with and get them there godders if if he was in the chat there's there's several of you here so i hope that helps and and when you, when you examine it and when you think about it, and that's why we do these live streams, we pick apart these concepts and we talk about why, 
Why do we position ourselves in this space? Why are we going to make that call of the intentionally raised ball? Why are we worried about face masks and when they get dropped and when the ball hits them? And, you know, why, why, why? If we question and critically think about these things, we realize that a lot of stuff that came out of the past was just because one person figured it was a good idea and had zero evidence and zero rationale and logic behind making that choice because they didn't bother to think critically. And then they perpetrate that myth down the line. So much of umpiring is about that. And it drives me nuts. Imagine doing that for playing. Well, I always figured that, you know, hitting the ball with the shape of the stick, you know, worked better. So everybody has to do it. Why? I don't have any the physics. Never talk about it. You'd never do that. So why do we do that in umpire? Not anymore, friends. Not anymore. We're changing worlds here. Yes, you are. Good. Yeah. How, how you like that? Okay. I just, I just press that button just so I can dance. Yep. Nice, nice in advance. Reaching out to coaches that you see on a regular basis and just go, hey, dude, I know I'm not umpiring a game next week, but, uh, you know, do you want to talk about the new rules? There's this great live stream you could watch. Do you want to talk about the rules? I, I know some stuff. And I'd, I'd love for you to be up to date. The conversations after the game, they're late, but still, they're better than not having any at all. Have those conversations. It's good. Yeah, absolutely. And that has to be, you know, ha has to be accommodated. And, and you would hope that the leagues and teams have that, have a system to sort that out. Okay. But again, it's, it's not, anyway, I'll just stop. Hi. Good to see you, Ryan. You teach them. NIC, get the names, report on your inspection, various colors on most fields here. The goal line is yellow, the circle is black. Flip the coin. Mm, okay. Yep, works. It works. And so there you go. Any other questions on the coin toss? Any other last thoughts on the intentionally raised hit that we talked about for almost an hour? Ah, homework for next week is I've been collecting the questions about face masks. What happens if they drop them just before they cross the 23? What happens if they're still being worn after the 23? What if they don't discard them when there was an opportunity to do so? K and HB. Bring your questions, your hypotheticals, or situations you've actually seen, and we will deal with them next week. Okay, because I think it's something that we can... Yeah, break down methodically and get some consensus on because that is that is sort of missing in a lot of those things. That'll happen next week. Anything you see on the socials, you see a scenario, self-pass has put something crazy out again, whatever the case might be, please come into the Discord server and post it. We'll have a pre-chat about it. And if it's cool, if it's interesting then we will talk about it right here on What Up Wednesday. And yeah, great show. I know it was one of those things that we didn't really get to a solid answer. I just, all I can tell you is player instinct, umpire gut instinct is I would do exactly what I saw in those situations and just let it play on. And this is something that, you know, maybe, uh, I, I would like to see a change in the phrasing of the rule so that it matches the way that the game is played. End of story. If you haven't yet, yeah, there's that thing. Wait, I've got a little button. No, that way, that way. I'd love to have your likes. If you haven't subscribed and clicked that notify button, please do. If you don't get your notifications, it's probably because you either have them turned off in your app or you haven't turned on all notifications for this channel. So you, you might not get everything. So do that. I'd love to see in the Discord. Please come over, 
chats are fun. It's a good time. And yeah, let's do this again in about, you know, 22 and a half hours or 22 and a half hours, six days and 22 and a half hours. How about that? Watch parties start tomorrow for Pan Am Cup. And we'll try to get a couple of the Africa Cup of Nations matches in there too. That all happens in the Discord for Yellow members. Join Yellow. It's fun. FHU3T.com. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining in. And have a great hockey week.